following program is sponsored by CBN. Today, music royalty in his blood. Growing up in the Cassidy's was its own unique experience. And cocaine coursing through his veins. My heart started uncontrollably pounding out of my chest. The Voice contestant Jack Cassidy shares his rise. I guess I was chasing that high again. His fall. And I got pretty instantly hooked. And his rebirth. God was literally breathing life into me. On today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club and thanks so much for joining us. We have a bombshell story out of Israel. Software intended to fight terrorism and organized crime instead was used against Israeli civilians, including Benjamin Netanyahu's son and his associates. The illegal use of the Pegasus software is being called borderline treason. Chris Mitchell brings us the reaction to these revelations from Jerusalem. Israeli Prime Minister Naftali Bennett called the reports unacceptable in a democratic state. These cyber tools are intended to fight terror, intended to fight severe crime. They were not intended to be used against citizens. We will check the matter in a transparent, profound and swift way, because all of us deserve answers. Former Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was even stronger. This is a black day for the state of Israel. Without referring to my issue, which of course has wide implications, I think this case concerns all citizens of the country. Not right, not left, all citizens of the country without exception. Something inconceivable has happened here. The Israeli publication Calculus first reported that police used Pegasus spyware to hack phones of Israelis, including Netanyahu's son Avner and members of his inner circle. Officials in the police illegally spied with the most aggressive tools in the world. Citizens were followed, listened to, exposed their most hidden secrets, and who knows what improper use was made of this espionage. This is unprecedented. It is borderline on espionage and treason by an internal uh, authority, and this is highly problematic. Pegasus spyware is produced by the Israeli NSO group, which maintains it doesn't disclose clients and has no access to the intelligence that's collected. The company adds that all sales are approved by Israel's defense ministry because the spyware is used by governments to fight crime and terrorism. Attorney Jonathan Klinger says current Israeli law makes it nearly impossible to install spyware programs on civilian phones except for national security issues. This means that the collection of data was immense and unprecedented, all done illegally, creating and establishing a database that might harm everyone else and without any legal oversight of that is. One of those reportedly spied on is a former Netanyahu aide turned state witness. If the allegations are true, some analysts believe it could be enough to have the case against Netanyahu thrown out of court, creating yet another political earthquake. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, this is an incredible story, a government spying on its own citizens, a government spying on its own politicians. There's a doctrine in, in law, and it dates back to, to the 1920s in the United States, and it's called the fruit of the poisonous tree. So in Netanyahu's trial, there are people that are both state witnesses, but there's also a co-defendant, and apparently the allegation is Pegasus software was put on their phones and evidence was gathered. Well, if that happened, then the entire case gets thrown out. If that happens and Netanyahu walks away from this um, corruption trial, it's a, it's a re really odd trial, but if he walks away from it, uh, talk about a political earthquake, it will be a political earthquake and there will likely be calls for new elections in Israel. Well, in other news, for the first time, the United States is taking aim at a major gas pipeline in Europe in order to stop Russia from invading Ukraine. John Jessup has more on that story from our CBN News Bureau in Washington. John? That warning, Gordon, coming from President Biden, who at a White House press conference with German Chancellor Olaf Scholz Monday said if Russia invades Ukraine, the United States would halt the Nord Stream 2 pipeline set to ship natural gas from Russia to Germany. 
There will be no longer a Nord Stream 2. We, we will bring an end to it. I promise you we'll be able to do it. The pipeline that's expected to begin operations later this year is a major sticking point for Germany, which is heavily dependent on Russian energy. Schultz did not mention Nord Stream, but said the U.S. and Germany are absolutely united in their response. Meanwhile, French President Emmanuel Macron is in Kyiv today to meet with Ukraine's leaders after a five-hour meeting in Moscow with Russia's Vladimir Putin Monday. The leaders reported no breakthroughs, but Putin did say he's open to more discussions. Well, here at home, in the aftermath of last month's Texas synagogue shooting, a behind-the-scenes example of cooperation between different faith groups is coming to light. As CBN senior national affairs correspondent Heather Sells reports, a Southern Baptist pastor brought a Muslim imam together with law enforcement to assist during the standoff. When the crisis came and they needed help, I could respond. And so it was basically purely because of the relationships. The recent synagogue attack in North Texas brought together leaders from three faiths who already had forged relationships. This multi-faith bridge building is helping to advance the well-being of our country's growing diverse communities. For more than 20 years, Southern Baptist pastor Bob Roberts has sought to be a peacemaker, seeking out Islamic, Jewish, and other faith leaders worldwide to work for the common good. The effort paid off in his own backyard January 15th when a gunman took a rabbi and three others hostage in a nearby synagogue. Roberts began working his network, quickly calling on a local imam to come to the scene. I explained to them that this man could de-escalate the situation like no one else. And so it enabled us to get him in the room uh, with us, and uh, we were able to work scenarios. At the same time, the rabbi's family was there in the room, so we were with them, uh, giving them comfort. It was all about relationships. After a 10-hour siege, the hostages escaped as the FBI shot and killed the gunman. Collierville's uh, one of the safest cities in Texas. Authorities say the gunman demanded the release of a Pakistani scientist convicted of trying to kill U.S. troops in Afghanistan and serving her sentence near Colleyville. They also report the gunman made anti-Semitic statements. Colleyville is just the latest in a resurgence of hate crimes in the U.S., specifically anti-Semitism. It's one more reason why Robert says this work is so important. We're all dealing with threats of violence in churches, mosques, and synagogues. And if we don't come together and have some consistent ways of working together when these crises comes, we're in trouble. The attack and Robert's role may well spur interest in this approach. Registration has spiked for a multi-faith forum in March that will bring together high-profile pastors, rabbis and imams. If these efforts continue to expand, proponents say they could help to build stronger communities. Heather Sells, CBN News. Put a, putting a premium on relationships. Excellent report, Heather. Gordon, back to you. Oh, let's all put a premium on relationships and uh, just anything that would attempt to demonize other people just based on ideology. Uh, we need to look at that and, and call it for what it is attempts to demonize or from demons. It's not from God. God wants us to have unity. God wants us to have fellowship. God wants us to have community. Uh, that's what he wants. He wants us to love one another. And when we do that and do that with intent, uh, where you reach across divides, you try to find common ground, uh, that's when you can really have some incredible things can happen. Wouldn't that be wonderful if it happened in politics in our country today? Wouldn't it be wonderful if it happened in our synagogues, in our churches, in our mosques? Uh, it, can we find ways to come together? Because now more than ever, we need to. I've said it many times, I'll say it again. A house divided cannot stand. The great experiment of the United States of America where you can have all religions living in harmony, where you can have wide variety of view, viewpoints, but all still American. What a wonderful thing. It's an example to the entire world. In our current polarization and our current demonization, can we take a step back and realize, well, there's a much greater good. Let's try to achieve that.
Ashley? Such a beautiful story. Well, still ahead, the grandson of Hollywood royalty, Jack Cassidy, talks about his stint on in the spotlight on The Voice, and he'll tell you what happened when his dream of winning the contest was dashed. That's coming up. Plus, the so-called right of return. Thousands of Palestinian children have been indoctrinated with this false concept for decades. See how it could lead to a disaster for the Jewish state after this. For decades, the most contentious issue in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict has been the right of return. A former member of Israel's parliament says the ramifications of that issue could be disastrous for the Jewish state. Chris Mitchell explains. Right of return means that Palestinians who fled during the war of Israel's independence in 1948 and their descendants could return to Israel. That could lead to millions of Palestinians flooding in and creating a demographic tsunami overwhelming the Jewish state. UNRWA, the UN agency responsible for Palestinian refugees in the West Bank and Gaza, has fueled this idea of the right of return for decades to the generations of students they teach. Palestinian children are taught their real homes are in modern day Israel, not far from where they live now. We have to fight against them in order to get back our land. The right of return means we must return to our land and expel the conquerors exactly like they did to us. The right of return is an integral part of the curriculum. In her book, The War of Return, author Anat Wilf shows the right of return goes to the core of the conflict. Wilf says through the years, the Palestinians have demonstrated they put a greater priority on keeping Jews from establishing their own state than having one of their own. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, for more on this story, joining us is author Dr. Anat Wilf. Dr. Wilf, welcome to the 700 Club. Thank you for having me. You were part of the Israeli left, uh, the peace camp. And so tell us about your background and how did you get to where you are today? Yes, uh, I grew up uh, and was a member of the Israeli Labor Party. I worked with peacemakers such as Yossi Balin, the architect of the Oslo Accords, and Shimon Peres, the recipient of the Nobel Peace Prize. And for many years, as part of the camp, I believed that we had a path to peace, which was straightforward and simple, known as the equation of land for peace. If Israel would hand over land, whether the Sinai or the Golan Heights or the West Bank and Gaza, if Israel were to hand this land to its Arab neighbors, Israel could be guaranteed of peace. Well, you no longer believe that. And so um, wh wh why have you, I mean, that's a, you're essentially saying the two-state solution will never work. So, so why do you think that? It's different from saying the two-state solution would never work in the sense that at the end of the day, there are two peoples in the lands and they seem to agree quite violently that they are not the other. And I think they would be both best served by governing their own and separate polities. The problem is that this has been made impossible because the conflict was never about land. And that's what Jews like myself in Israel uh, learned in the hard way realizing that the Arabs of the land, the Palestinians, have been always committed from the get-go to the idea of no sovereign state for the Jewish borders in any borders whatsoever. Uh, so as far as they're concerned, they're not interested in having a Palestinian state in part of the land if in another part of the land there is a Jewish state. And the way that this rejection of a Jewish state is manifested is, is in their insistence on something that they call the right of return. But in the book we show is neither a right nor a return. Well, tell us the way forward then. If, if on, on the Palestinian side you have an ideology that says we can never give up this, this right. We want to take Tel Aviv. Uh, we want to take Jaffa. We want to take Haifa. Uh, we can't ever allow uh, a Jewish state, in, e e even in Tel Aviv. If, if that's their ideology, what's the way forward? Well, on your show, you have stories of people who have changed, who have been reborn. Uh, so I say never is a long time. 
Yes, the current ideology of the Palestinians in place for the last century is no Jewish state and no borders whatsoever. This ideology has been under uh, basically supported and sustained by a UN agency called UNRWA. It's been funded by the US, except during the Trump presidency and the West. So for over a century, the Palestinians were actually sustained in their worldview that Israel as a Jewish state is a temporary aberration that is bound to disappear, which is why they refused any compromise. So if we are ever to get to peace and compromise, my message is that the West and the Arab world needs to give Palestinians some tough messages, which is that Israel is here to stay, that the Jewish people have a historical connection to the land. They have the right to their own state in at least part of the land. And the Palestinians have to come to terms with that. Uh, in the book, we show other peoples who, when they received those messages, which were basically, we know it's tough, but move on, they ultimately moved on. It took a generation, sometimes less, sometimes more, but ultimately people changed and realized they have to come to terms with reality. The Palestinians are yet to come to terms with reality because they have been sustained in their worldview that they don't have to accept the reality of the state of Israel. Uh, I've been saying for years, UNRWA needs to go away, uh, that this is American taxpayer dollars going in to fund ideologic, ideologi an ideology being taught to children on a continual basis that they have to wipe out the Jews. I've also said we cannot support financially the pa Palestinian Authority because a portion of that funding goes in to pay for the martyr payments. And, and that is all based on how many Israelis you kill. So uh, we had, a, uh, I guess, a, a moment of tough love with Ambassador David Friedman saying enough already. And under the Trump administration, UNRWA funding was eliminated. Uh, Palestinian Authority funding was almost eliminated, but, but re reduced. Now, under the Biden administration, it's this grand reset where UNRWA is now being refunded. Palestinian Authority, they're trying to reopen a consulate to them. Uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan is showing, well, if you just wait it out, the West will get tired. Um, uh, it, you know, from an ideological standpoint, have we, have we actually invigorated the concept of the right of return. Certainly, and that's a shame. And I know that President Biden is not supportive of the idea that Israel is temporary and that the Palestinians should therefore never compromise with it because one day it will revert to them. But there's this indulgence of the Palestinians. There's this refusal to give them the tough messages that are necessary to move forward. And this is unfortunate because for 70 years, the United States and the West are basically underwriting the conflict. Every day, they're funding an organization, UNRWA, that is teaching Palestinians that they don't need to compromise with Israel. They don't need to come to terms with it because one day from the river to the sea, from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, Palestine will be ex exclusively theirs. As a result, every time that they are pushed to the negotiating table with Israel, they run away because they're not interested in finally making a compromise. And the American administration is underwriting that by giving money to UNRWA. And in the book, we also show that there's a direct link between the UNRWA schools and raising another generation of people who turn to terrorism because they believe they are justified in every means in fighting against Israel. How much does corruption play a role in this? I mean, it's been pointed out since the 1950s that the Palestinian people are actually pawns of their leadership. They're intentionally kept in camps. They're intentionally kept in poverty and deprivation. They're not allowed to get citizenship in, in Lebanon or you know, these other neighboring countries. They're never allowed to get a job. All of these things happening. Um, how much is, is just, just out and out greed on the part of the leadership uh, to put money into their Swiss bank accounts? How much is that paying a part in, of this? 
Unfortunately, that would actually make things easy. Unfortunately, what we discovered in the book is that the, uh, the complete and blanket rejection of the idea that the Jewish people have a right to sovereign state in any part of the land is the most common consensus of all Palestinians. So what we show in the book is actually it is the Palestinians themselves, the Arab refugees themselves after the war, who refuse resettlement, who refuse to move forward. They are the ones who want to keep fighting. And when they have some leaders who are trying to move on, such as the Jordanian king who gave them citizenship and did not demand return from Israel, they assassinated him. Or we show other local entrepreneurs who try to build uh, new ways for them to prosper and they destroy them. So it is the people themselves who are rejecting the idea of peace with Israel. And as a result, they give birth to leaders who cannot move right and left from this idea that there is no compromise with Israel. So while there is corruption, the issue of corruption is secondary to this broad ideology. Sometimes people say, let's make sure that UNRWA is run properly and accountable. And my answer is, I don't want an organization dedicated to the destruction of the state of Israel to be better on its books. I want the organization not to exist and not to teach another generation of Palestinians that all of Israel is theirs and that they need to dedicate their lives to take it so-called back from the foreign invaders, which is their belief. Dr. Wolf, that was well said, and the book is incredible. It's a real eye-opener that the fundamental problem is an ideological problem, and until we solve that, we'll never have peace. Uh, thank you for this interview. Thank you for the book and for you at home. I encourage you to get a copy of this book and get it to your senator and to your congressman. It would be wonderful if everybody in the State Department read it. Uh, it's called The War of Return. It's available wherever books are sold. Ashley? Well, still ahead, meet a Marine fighter pilot who was grounded by cancer. This warrior was given just two years to live, but he'll tell you himself how he defied death and resumed flying coming up. Also ahead, a fall from the voice that sent this singer into a cocaine-fueled addiction. Find out who he called for help and what he learned about coming clean. Jack Cassidy was 17 years old when he was selected to be a contestant on The Voice. He was in his element and convinced he could win it all. So when Jack was cut from the contest, his dreams were dashed and his life was soon hanging in the balance. I did one line that night, that was too much. And I felt my whole body start to shut down and go cold and my heart started uncontrollably pounding out of my chest. Jack Cassidy is the grandson of actress Shirley Jones. He grew up in a musical family with his dad Patrick and his uncles, David and Sean Cassidy. Growing up in the Cassidys was was interesting. It was, uh, you know, it's definitely it's its own unique experience. My parents tried to keep me very, very grounded and really instill what was important, which is just normal family life and love. And mom sent me to a church camp called Forest Home. She thought me and our family needed Christ because <laughs> we were going through some rough stuff and she's like, hopefully my kids can find Jesus. That summer, he encountered the unconditional love of Christ at camp and gave his life to Jesus. I just said yes, but from there, my prayer became a prayer for evidence. And over the next few years, I just got flooded with those evidences. Jesus showing up in very miraculous ways in my life and, and giving me peace in the midst of chaotic circumstances and just definitely affirmed for me that there was power in the name of Jesus. In high school, Jack was a talented singer and worship leader. When he was 17, he was selected to be a contestant on The Voice. Jack was thrilled to have a platform to share Jesus. I had never done anything in the music business before and you know, trying to succeed on that show or win that show was definitely the goal. It was like, oh, I definitely belong here. I was working with other artists and working with the coaches. And it was like, this is, this is where I fit in. This is, this is who God created me to be. Jack's time on The Voice took him to the top 12, but his dreams of winning it all were dashed 
when he was voted off. I let that show get the better of me and I just got caught up in, in that world. Uh, so when things returned to a state of normalcy, it was a, it was a much bigger fall. And I guess I was chasing that high again and, and I was allowing myself to let my Christian guard down and went to a lot of parties and interacted with a lot of worldly type things, which was temporarily soothing the depression and the fall from that show that I was, that I was experiencing. At one of those parties, Jack was introduced to cocaine. From the first time I tried cocaine, I got pretty instantly hooked. It started to become every day, all day, and it completely destroyed my life in every aspect. It, it drained my bank account completely. It made me start to steal just to, just to, get, just to get drugs. For the next year and a half, Jack isolated himself from friends and family as his drug addiction took over his life. Found a new batch of drugs that was just a lot stronger. And I did one line that night that was, that was too much. And I felt my whole body start to shut down and go cold. And my heart started uncontrollably pounding out of my chest. And it felt like it was, it was right on the verge of a heart attack. And I felt like I, I couldn't really call the ambulance or, or get any help. Alone and desperate, Jack remembered the power of Jesus' name he experienced earlier in life and cried out for help. Even though I had buried God really deep in that season, I hit my knees in the midst of that full-blown chaos, and I just cried out to him and asked him to let me live, to save my life in a moment of total, total brokenness, total darkness, did not deserve to be saved. I got myself here. I felt the spirit come in in that moment and completely overpower the chaos and the drugs that I'd put in my body. And the drugs were warring against me, trying to make my body shut down, but God was literally breathing life into me. His power in my spirit in the midst of all that is what was keeping me in a place of real peace and, and calming my heart down and, and keeping me literally alive. Jack realized how far he had fallen from the calling he once had. After that experience, it really exposed what cocaine was. It was not a friend. It was not a helper to get me out of those places. It was leading me to a place of death. And when Jesus showed up in such a radical way in the midst of that, it really made it really real and tangible that he was the way to life. Jesus showed that, no, I'm, I'm Lord over that. And I can be Lord over all these things in your life. So it really established this, this deep-rooted trust in God. Jack has been free from drugs since 2018 and shares his deep appreciation for God's love in his music. He is willing to meet us in whatever place that we're in. And that varies for everyone. For me, the darkest moments I walked through, he wanted to meet me and redeem me in that place. And he came with a spirit of kindness, a spirit of love, and a spirit of, I just want to help you. And, and he's willing to do that in whatever scenario people walk through. Listen to those lyrics. Let go and let God. I'm learning to be the real me. That is where our identity is, friends. Our identity is not in what we do. It's not even in what we do for God. It is being a child, a son, and a daughter of the Most High God. As I was watching that story, I'm reminded of the scripture in Romans that says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. It doesn't matter what you've done. Here's Jack, he was on a, bend, a, a bender of cocaine and he's experiencing this physical just attack, not just physical, but spiritual. And he remembers, he remembers the love of God. He remembers that he can cry out to Jesus and he did, and God answered him. And I don't know where you're at today, friend, but if you're in a dark place and there's a lot of chaos going on, not just 
in the circumstances of life, but chaos in your heart, I want to encourage you to cry out to Jesus. It doesn't matter what you've done. God is just calling you back to himself. Cry out to Jesus today. Say, Jesus, I need you. I need you to be Lord of my life. I need you to bring peace to the chaos in my soul and in my spirit and my heart. If that's you today, pray with me right now to invite Jesus into your mess because he is willing and able to do what he did in Jack's life and your life. Pray with me right now. Lord Jesus, I cry out to you and I am, I'm done doing my life my way. I am in turmoil. I don't know where to go. I don't know where to turn, but Jesus, I'm crying out to you, my savior. Lord God, will you deliver me from this mess? Lord God, will you save me from myself? Will you save me from the addictions, the trauma, the pain physically, emotionally, and spiritually? God, today I put my hope and my faith in you and you alone. Today I turn from my wicked ways and I look to you, Jesus, the author and the finisher of my faith, my savior, my friend. Thank you for the forgiveness of my sins, Lord Jesus. Transform me, cleanse me, make me new today, Lord. Purify me, Jesus. In Jesus' name, I pray and ask all of this. Amen and amen. And Lord, I just lift up my friends, my brothers and sisters who have just prayed this prayer with me. And I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you touch them right now in Jesus' name, that they feel the tangible presence of God, the permeable love of God, and I pray that they are transformed today from the inside out. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray and ask all of this. Amen and amen. Friend, if you just prayed that prayer with me, please give us a call. 1-800-700-7000. There is always a prayer warrior ready, willing, and able to pray with you on the other line. And we've got some amazing resources for you that are just going to help encourage you and help you along in your new faith journey. This is called A New Day. It's a pamphlet and a CD. We can also get you a digital download. So just give us a call, 1-800-700-7000, or you can visit cbn.com for that. Gordon? Coming up, the marine aviator who changed history. This fighter pilot was grounded after he was diagnosed with cancer. Hear how he, cured, he was cured without chemo, without radiation, and how he returned to the cockpit against all odds. Welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. Governors in four states announced plans Monday to lift statewide mask mandates in schools. It's a response to signs the latest COVID wave is on the decline. Connecticut, Delaware, New Jersey, and Oregon will halt requirements by the end of February or sometime in March. New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy called the move, quote, a huge step back toward normalcy for our kids. New York's governor says she will make a decision on masks Wednesday. The Russia-Ukraine crisis affecting Americans right here at home as gas prices rise. The national average is now $3.44 a gallon, up eight cents over last week, and the highest in almost eight years. Analysts blame the increase on fears that Vladimir Putin could cut off the flow of Russian crude oil in response to international sanctions. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Gordon and Ashley will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. The story of David and Goliath has thrilled children for centuries. It's also inspired a Buddhist boy from Cambodia. He saw the Bible story for the first time watching CBN's Superbook. Take a look. Nine-year-old Seah first heard about the gospel by watching CBN's Superbook cartoons at a church near his home in Cambodia. I was playing near the church. Pastor invited me to come in. I wonder why so many kids that I knew were there. That day, Saya told us he watched the Superbook episode about David and Goliath. Goliath swung his sword at David, but David threw a stone at his forehead. Goliath fell down and David cut him with the sword. 
I love David because he's strong and brave. Saya told us he'd grown up in a traditional Buddhist family. My grandmother said, if I burn incense and pray, that I would receive what I asked for, but I never received anything, so I did not like to go there anymore. He said after he watched Superbook, he decided to pray to become a Christian. After I believe in Jesus, I was so happy because I know if I have faith in God, I will be strong just like David. This past year during COVID, things have been tough for Saya and his family. In the morning, I went for the rice pot, but there's nothing to eat. So I asked my grandmother, what do we have to eat? And she said, I am sorry, child. There is no food for breakfast or lunch. When CBN's Orphan's Promise heard about their situation, we gave the family food packs, which they said they were able to make last for two months. Now that the church program has reopened, Sayat took his brother P. Seth to watch Superbook. P. Seth prayed to become a Christian, and now their grandma goes to church with the boys too. Thank you to all the donors who gave us food and help us know Jesus through Superbook. If you're a member of the 700 Club, you're part of that. You're part of all that we do around the world. A portion of every gift goes into the work of CBN International. You create all the infrastructure, everything that's required so that we can get these wonderful cartoons on the air in places like Cambodia. We have a broadcast map I'd like to show you where you can see all the different languages. You can see all the different places where you're having an impact, where you're telling the children of the world the stories of the Bible through Superbook. Not in English, but in their own language. That's the wonderful thing about animation. It gets to be translated in all these different languages. So you can be a part of it. So if you want to join the 700 Club, it's real easy. Pick up the phone. Call us. 1-800-700-7000. Now, when you call and join the 700 Club, we've got something for you. It's my father's latest book. It's called The Power of the Holy Spirit. Let me emphasize this in the title, In You. This book will teach you how you can get direct guidance from God for your life. These are life examples from my father, how the Holy Spirit has steered every decision at, at CBN for now over 60 years. And, and my father's written this book to help you, to guide you so that you can be directed as well. If you'd like it, it's yours when you join. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. And if you want to designate your gift to Superbook, we have something called the Superbook Club, and you'll get three copies of the newest episode of Superbook every four weeks, and then your debit or credit card will be automatically debited $25. So our latest episode is The Widow's Might, and I love this one. This one is... is uh, it's, it's an incredible teaching tool for kids to show them the power of generosity. So if you'd like that and want not just one copy, we'll send you three copies uh, so that you can have one for yourself, one to give away to friends, to family. If you'd like that, again, call us, 1-800-700-7000. Say, I want to join the Superbook Club. You can also join by going to CBN.com. There's a place there where you can join on the donation uh, member. So... As a Superbook Club member, you can also get all the episodes, season one through five, uh, streaming through the CBN Family app and through the Superbook app, uh, all, all yours, part of the benefit of being a Superbook Club member. So if you like it, give us a call, 1-800-700-7000. Ashley? Well, up next, meet a retired Marine fire pilot. Lieutenant David Trombley will tell you how he fought cancer without conventional treatments and how he became the first Marine aviator to beat his disease and be returned to official flight status. He joins us live right after this, so don't go anywhere. Well, Lieutenant Colonel David Trombley was just 31 years old and supporting a family of six when he was diagnosed with cancer. This Marine fighter pilot was also instantly grounded. That day, he vowed not only to beat his disease, but also to fly again. Lieutenant Colonel David Trombley was a young, fit Marine fighter pilot in 2000. 
that fall. A rare bone cancer threatened to end his bright career and his life. Only 50 others that had what I had that they could show me and not one of them had survived five years. Through natural healing methods and a staunch reliance on God, David became the first Marine aviator to change that statistic. As he explains in Grounded and Cured, David returned to the cockpit and the rich family life he cherishes. All right, well, please welcome to the 700 Club Lieutenant Colonel David Tromley. David Tromley, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks, Ashley. It's an honor to be here. It's an honor to have you. All right, well, what did you say to the dentist when he first told you that you had cancer? So uh, when uh, I was first diagnosed, uh, this was the first time that this dentist of over 20 years in the Navy had ever diagnosed anybody with cancer. In fact, he was, uh, I found out later he's a fellow believer. And he was really distraught as I reached for my records after our short 15, 20 minute discussion. I reached with my other hand and I grabbed his hand. I squeezed very hard to get his attention, not to be disrespectful. And I said, Doc, I'm not dead yet. And a strong will to win is second only to a deep faith in God. I've got both. I'm not only going to beat this disease, but I will fly again. Uh, I will fly again. And I thought that I was encouraging my doctor. I come to find out as I got to my car and started to process all that was happening, I realized in that moment that uh, that, that was a God moment, that God was with me in that room and that the Holy Spirit uh, gave me those words. Those weren't from my doctor. Those words were God telling me, you will beat this disease and you will fly again. And I had the chance to go back and tell my wife the bad news. Mm. I've got lymphoma and the good news and God showed up and I believe we're gonna beat this and fly again. Wow, that is incredible. Well, David, what treatment options were you offered and what was your long-term prognosis? Uh, well, I was offered uh, chemo, radiation and surgery. They had taken the uh, tumor out of my jawbone. It was uh, right here. And so that was a uh, oral surgery. They wanted to go in and actually resect my jawbone and do radiation and surgery. And uh, I asked them, I said, you know, how successful have you been? These are my military doctors. And they could only produce uh, two studies of about 50 people. Not, uh, not one of those people had survived up to five years. Most were still uh, either fighting it or had already or were already deceased. So uh, I got a second opinion with civilian doctors and uh, they said, no, we don't want to do surgery or radiation. We want to do double chemo. And after military and civilian doctors giving two different types of diagnosis, we thought, um, well, we lost our peace in the conventional and asked God to open doors. And he very rapidly did between conversations with folks who had beat cancer naturally, books and um, just moment after God, moment after moment, we found a path. And within months, we were on a completely holistic approach. Wow, that is amazing. Well, with the support of your wife, Megan, you, like you said, began a journey of natural healing. What were some of those things that you did? Well, I know we don't have a whole lot of time to detail everything. Uh, so briefly, uh, between whole house water purification, raw diet, detoxing mm -hmm. everything from colon and liver and blood, um, that raw diet was absolutely key and just getting all the chemicals out of our home. Uh, therapeutics from Canada and even taking uh, a month to do uh, some alternative treatments you couldn't get in the States over in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. uh, all of that is detailed in our book, Grounded and Cured, and it was written to be uh, everything from an encouragement to point people to God and to Christ and to find peace and hope in the valley, but also those very resources like a, a battle plan for cancer warriors. Yeah, absolutely. I love that you do that in the book. Well, David, how did your faith sustain you during your treatment and just during this time of, of fighting the battle of cancer? Yeah, that's that's a wonderful question. And uh, there's only one appendix in the back of our book, and it basically details all the scriptures that God just basically brought to us um, through, uh, whether it be Sunday preaching, friends that would send us things, or just personal study. And Psalm 91 is the most powerful passage. It is, uh, it is, it is my life passage. Uh, and I read that every day as I would pray and just ask God for discernment and peace and the discipline to get through. So Psalm 91 is is a powerful um, passage I would just share with all of your listeners today. If you're in a valley, read that passage today. But I just got to share this one really powerful moment. Um, a few days in, I had to tell my children that I had cancer. And when I sat them all down, I said, guys, uh, I got, I've got cancer, but God's bigger than cancer. We've seen this as Gamma and Papa have both beat it last year. Now, Dad has it, but, but God's bigger. And I want you to remember something. And I want you to memorize something. And my children were eight and six and almost three and six months old. And I said, for God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. And I asked them to memorize that. When I came back from the hospital 10 days later with Megan and our, our six-month-old Grace, 
my uh, youngest son was the first to greet us as we got back to back to the house. And he came and said, dad, dad, dad. And as he got my attention, he looked at me and he says, dad, well, God had not given it to people to fear, but a power and a wealth and a town mind. Oh, my gosh. And to this day, that, that still gets me because I knew I had the love of my son. I also knew that God had my family. So he not only had me, he had all of us. Yeah. And scripture had guided us through. Absolutely. I love, love that story. Well, when did you win the battle and become cancer free, David? It took about 11 months and all of that is detailed in the story. There's about five chapters that speak specifically of what we did in Switzerland. And I believe halfway through that wilderness experience in Switzerland, I just knew that I knew that I was cancer free. And uh, I continued with the therapies there. But once I got back, about nine days later, we did a CAT scan, showed the tumor was gone. 30 days later, I did an MRI, and that's when the medical community, the military medical community said, yes, you are cancer free. Mm-hmm. And um, that was also the week of September 11, 2000, and we all know where we were. And so that, that week has a lot of emotion uh, for so many of us. But that Friday after that Tuesday when the towers fell was the day I found out I was cancer free. And it started the second half of our story and the second miracle, fighting the, the Navy medicine system to get back in the cockpit. Well, how did you manage to return to flying? Good leadership. Good mm-hmm. leadership. We had great leadership in the Marine Corps and Navy leaders that wrote great fit reps that, that um, advocated on my behalf to get medical boards to look at me. Uh, the medical community didn't want to touch me. I didn't do the chemo or the radiation. They said that uh, my judgment was flawed because I didn't do what they said. But I had some great leaders, a general um, and uh, a couple of colonels, a Navy captain, all very senior officers who basically wrote endorsements to get the medical community to take a second look. And two years later, I was reinstated to flight status. And wow. it's that military leadership that made me decide to stay in and do a full 25 year career because I wanted to honor the leaders that took care of me. Wow. Well, David, thank you so much for joining us today. It's an honor to talk to you. And thank you so much for sharing your story. I encourage all of our viewers and listeners, get David's book. It's called Grounded and Cured, and it's available wherever books are sold. Thank you so much, David. God bless you. It's an honor. Thank you very much. All right. Well, I believe we have that some. Was a wonderful le- story. I mean, wow. I'm I'm glad he got back I, I in the love cockpit. Out of the mouth of babes. Yeah. You know that just and it still it broke me up. Not yeah. Just down. Yeah. It's beautiful. All right. Well, we got some time for email. Are you ready? Uh, I think. I am. <laughs> All right. Well, this is I'll from. Let you answer it. How about that? Oh no, I'm gonna let you answer. How about that? This is from Linda. She says, "I like to listen to your perspective on the news. I was wondering if you could go in depth on the right to vote bill." Why was it needed in the past and why was it temporary? What is in the bill that makes people fight it? I am fearful that segregation and legal racism could rear its ugly head. It's only been a generation since 1963 and the political animosity could send us backwards. Well, I think the political animosity has already sent us backwards. But here's something that, you know, I just want to correct it factually. The Voting Rights Act, the Civil Rights Act aren't temporary. Uh, they're a part of the law of the land in the United States of America. Now, have politicians gotten skilled in how to comply with the Voting Rights Act and still get what they want? You, you can look at a lot of election laws as incumbent protection acts. Uh, and, you know, just it's, it's one of those things that you have to be an insider to know how it's operated and it always benefits the incumbent politicians. So um, right here in Virginia, we have an entire um, uh, district that's been carved out for minority votes. It's called the third district. The representative is Bobby Scott, but it was in essence a way to carve those districts out of other districts. And so there's, I guess there's ways to um, manipulate the system. But the current di- uh, dialogue, I think, is really hurting us. Uh, when you have a sitting president, President Biden, going down to Georgia and saying, I'm going into the belly of the beast and all of this, um, Georgia voted for him. Uh, when you hear all the rhetoric, keep in mind the last presidential election, the greatest voter turnout in my lifetime you know, all this talk about where people are being deprived of their right to vote, well, uh, you, what alternate reality are you living in? Mm. 
Uh, we've had huge turnouts. The governor election here in Virginia, huge turnout for these things. And those votes are all counted. And, and if anyone's having a restriction in their right to vote, it's not showing up at the polls. We leave you these words from the book of Luke. With God, nothing will be impossible. That wonderful cancer story, keep that one in mind. Yeah. With God, nothing is impossible. You can have miracles, you can have victory, and you can have it today. God bless, we'll see you tomorrow.